God has sent Jacob back to Bethel, and he is intending now to uh, uh, begin to establish this remnant of his people in the land and the sons of Jacob, of course. The, the, apparent, uh, the important incident that takes place in chapter 32 is, of course, the change in Jacob's name. And God has made a, a principle, you remember, of changing of names, and it's manifest on a number of occasions through the Scripture, and it would probably be worthwhile if you would sometime just make special note of those individuals in the Word whose names God changed. Some of them are obvious, some of them are not. For example, uh, Joshua had his name changed. Did you all know that? What was Joshua's name before it was Joshua? Hosea. That's correct. Hosea means salvation or Savior. Uh, when you change that name to Joshua or in the Hebrew Yeshua, then it becomes the Hebrew equivalent of the name Jesus, which is simply a Greek transliteration of Yeshua, and it means Jehovah saves, or Jehovah is Savior. The uh, name of Solomon was changed. Did you know that? What, who called him Solomon? David called him Solomon. What did the Lord call him? Yedidia. Um, there are a lot of little hidden changes like that that follow. Well, for another one, just for an example, is Esther. Esther had her name changed. Esther is a pagan name. It's a derivative of Easter or Ishtaroth. What is uh, Hester's real name? Hmm? I remember that one. Hadassah. Hadassah was Esther's name. And all of these name changes are tremendously important when you begin to give some consideration to them. How many of you know the real names of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? You know why we know their names? Because we used to sing them. Uh, those are their pagan names, not their Hebrew names. We remember Daniel's Hebrew name. We do not usually remember his pagan name. His pagan name was Belteshazzar. But what were the Hebrew names of uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Now remember that. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah uh, when they were in that fiery furnace. If they'd have been Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in heart, they'd have burned up in that furnace. But they were really Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and therefore they wouldn't bow, they wouldn't bend, they wouldn't burn, as one fellow wrote. All right. Chapter 32 of Genesis now. God's going to change Jacob's name. Now, we indicated to you that Jacob is afraid to meet Esau. That shows up in the first portion of this passage, verse 6, if you would, 32 of Genesis. And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to thy brother Esau, and also he cometh to meet thee, and four hundred men with him, which did not give Jacob great joy. And Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. Now, what was the vow that Esau had made that he was something he was going to see to after his father died? Kill Jacob. Well, Jacob knows that, doesn't he? And so here he's about to meet Esau, and Esau's got 400 men with him. Well, of course, that didn't really uh, encourage Jacob a bit. And then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that were with him. And notice how he does this now. The flocks and herds and the camels into two bands, and said, If Esau come to the one company and smite it, then the other company, which is left, shall escape. And Jacob said, O oh God, am I... My father, he's going to pray now, Abraham, oh God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said unto me, Return unto thy country and thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. Now, what's he saying? He said, Lord, you told me to come back. <laughs> and look what I'm facing. I am not worthy of the least of all thy mercies and of all the truth which thou hast shown unto thy servant. For with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. And thou saidst, I will surely do thee good, and make thy seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. And he lodged there that night, and took of, the, uh, uh, took of that which came to his hand, a present for Esau his brother, two hundred she-goats, twenty uh, he-goats, two hundred ewes, twenty rams, 30 milk camels, and so forth. Verse 16, 
And he delivered them into the hand of his servants, every drove by themselves, and said unto his servants, Pass over before me, and put a space between drove and drove. And he commanded the foremost, saying, When Esau my brother meeteth thee, and asketh thee, saying, Whose art thou, and where goest thou, and whose are these before thee? Then thou shalt say, They are thy servant Jacob's. Now, was that the truth? No. In fact, Esau was servant to Jacob. It is a present sent unto my lord Esau, and behold, also he is behind us. Now, so where was Jacob going to put himself? Behind the whole multitude. <laughs> and so command he the second and the third, and also uh, all that followed the drove, saying, On this manner shall you speak unto Esau when you find him. Say, Moreover, behold, thy servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goeth before me, and afterward I will see his face peradventure, he will accept of me. Now verse uh, 20 and 21 and 22, I think, speak the uh, depth of this hiding behind it. So went the present over before him, and himself lodged that night in the company, and he arose up that night and took his two wives, his two women servants, and his eleven sons, and passed over the ford Jabbok. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over what he had. And Jacob was left alone. So he sent his family on ahead too. And Jacob was left alone. Now I want you to observe something before we read this incident. That Jacob, you'll recall, had made a bargain with God, had he not. He said, Lord, if you will, I will. And now all of a sudden he's coming to the Lord and says, Lord, I'm not worthy of all the blessings that you've passed upon me. Now in the midst of his diverse, uh, 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 adversity, Jacob is beginning to have a change of attitude. You must observe, and though this is a very minor one as we see it, there was no real problem, but as Jacob saw it, it was a monumental one because as far as he was concerned, his life was in danger. And in fact, it was, for that matter. If God had not touched the heart of Esau, it would have been a real problem. But you remember Solomon says in the Proverbs, if a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. And here is a good classic example of that. And Esau was indeed an enemy of Jacob, without question and his old posterity would be afterwards. In the midst of adversity, then, God begins to change the attitude in the heart of individuals. And if anyone would ever suggest to you, and I don't mean to ride a hobby, but I'm going to drop it right here. If anyone would ever suggest to you that the believer is to live in this world without adversity, he neither knows the Scripture nor the purposes of God. And God shapes his people by adversity. And never does he perfect the image of himself in his people apart from adversity. And if uh, the servant is not greater than his Lord, then that's how he perfected Christ. And don't ask me why it was necessary to perfect Christ. The scripture simply says, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience through the things that he suffered. And he made the captain of our salvation perfect through suffering. Those of you who are in the Hebrews class with us, and I don't know if any of you are, we've been dealing with that. Yes, sir. Just one comment quickly. If you, if you look in Luke 4, it's, I, I don't know anything about this, about the meanings of the words, but it says that Jesus, when he was in the wilderness, was full of the Spirit. And in verse 14, it says, after the temptation, it says, he returned in the power of the Spirit. Yes, and he grew in favor before God and men. Yes, that's right. And if uh, the servant is not greater than his Lord, then so are we. In the same manner, going to be perfected by that adversity. So God's got to get Jacob in a situation so Jacob can't help Jacob anymore. Jacob has been accustomed to being able to make it pretty well on his own, hadn't he? He went down to Laban's and... And sojourned there and became a very wealthy man, got a couple of wives and a couple of concubines, and now he's coming back two bands. But he's saying, Lord, I'm not worthy of all your favor. And God has to get every man in a circumstance where he can't help himself. There's no such thing as great men in God's economy. We, all God has is just little men with a great God. Somebody made a comment up here not too long ago, which I think was classic. You know, we're always looking for giants in the faith, aren't we? Hmm? Well, one brother said God doesn't have giants. He's got shepherd boys. Philistines got giants. And as long as we're looking for giants, we're never going to see God. But if we look for shepherd boys, then we'll see God. And here's the whole idea of John 3, isn't it? He that doeth the truth comes to the light that his deeds might be made manifest that they are what? Wrought in God. He didn't say he that doeth good, did he? Hmm? How come? Oh, no good in us, is there? Paul said, in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. So how do you expect to do good? No good thing going to come out of you. Absolutely not. As long as you think there will, forget it. But he that doeth the truth 
he that's honest about what he is. He'll come to the light and it'll be manifest that God did it and you didn't. And then God will get the glory and you won't. That's why the Lord set this whole thing up so it's by faith, you see. Uh, if it's by faith, then nobody can get the credit but God. If it's anything but by faith, then I can get the credit. All right, verse 24 then. <laughs> Jacob is left alone. Now what's Jacob's name mean? Supplanter, or cheat, if you would. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the break of the day. Now I want you to observe that the man wrestled with Jacob. Jacob did not wrestle with the man. Jacob didn't start the fight. Neither did he finish it, by the way. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, the angel prevailed not against Jacob. Why could he not prevail against him physically? To be sure. So what was he trying to prevail against? His spirit, precisely. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. Now you observe that the hollow of uh, the thigh is the strongest point of a man. So what happens to him physically here becomes a figure of what indeed happened to him spiritually. You will observe in Hebrews chapter 11, when by faith Jacob blessed his children, the scripture says that he blessed them leaning on his staff. Till the day that Jacob died, he was a cripple. And that crippled Jacob becomes an emblem to us and to all that were about him of the power of God in a man who had been weakened by the Lord. Paul said, when I'm weak, then I'm what? Strong. Of course, we've got that backwards, haven't we? <coughs> we think if we don't feel strong, we're not strong. The fact of the matter is how we feel is totally immaterial because his strength is only made perfect in weakness. Have you observed, by the way, in the book of Judges, the miserable lot of people that God called to deliver his people Israel? Hmm? Um, uh, Shamgar uh, delivered Israel with an ox goad. That's glorious, isn't it? An ox goad. At least he could have given him a shield and a sword. Uh, how about David and his sling? Hmm? Very humiliating circumstance. Left-handed man. Uh, and a left-handed man was considered to be an oddball in those days. For that matter, even a generation ago, a left-handed person was considered to be an oddball. Um, what's his name uh, with his 300 men? Uh, Gideon. Ho thou mighty man of valor. Where? Down there in that hole, threshing wheat. Who? Me? Uh, of all of the people that God ever chose to deliver Israel, there was never a mighty man among them. And if they became mighty, they became so because of the power of God and the anointing of the Lord upon them. The only exception to that in appearance, in outward circumstance, was whom? Saul, precisely. Saul stood head and shoulders above every man, and he looked the part, and he turned out to be a dud, and he becomes an example. And when Samuel, still laboring under the same misapprehension, comes to the sons of Jesse, you'll remember to choose a king, and he comes to Eliab, and Eliab looks for the part. He says, surely the anointing of the Lord is before me. And God said, Samuel, you're looking on the outward appearance. I'm looking on the heart. I'm after a shepherd boy. So finally, he got that little old ruddy kid out of the field who was keeping sheep, and he turned out to be the king. Totally contrary to where the mind of the flesh always goes. And we say that, but when it begins to work out, we don't really believe that, do we? So we touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh and he weakened him. In verse 26, and he said, let me go. Now the angel's talking. Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. Now Jacob had sense enough, as he always did. Remember, Jacob had a mind for what was spiritual, and he knew who was wrestling with him. And he said, Thy name shall be called... And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Supplanter. And he said, Thy name shall be no more called Supplanter, Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast 
prevailed. Now, Israel, obviously, uh, not just to change Jacob's name, but has prophetic import uh, to the whole of the generations that are going to be born out of Jacob. Uh, prince with God, or one who has power with God and over men, becomes the position then which his posterity and that nation, of course, and God's earthly inheritance are going to have in the generations that are yet to come. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there without telling him his name. You remember the parents of Samson asked the messenger that came from the Lord the same thing? What is your name? And what did the angel of the Lord answer? Why is it that you inquire after my name, seeing it is secret? The Hebrew word translated secret is the word wonderful. Why is it that you inquire after my name, seeing it is wonderful? What is the statement of Isaiah 9? And his name shall be called Wonderful. So who in fact is wrestling with Jacob? And who was it that appeared to uh, Manoah to announce the birth of Samson? Who in fact then is the angel of the Lord in those terms in the Old Testament? The son, yes. He isn't Jesus yet. He's going to be. He's the son indeed. Isaiah 9 further, Unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is what? Given. What's the difference? Outside of the fact that it is he Hebrew synthetic poetry, what is the distinction God is making between the two? All right, the child had to be born, but the son was ever existent in the bosom of the father and therefore was given. The child was provided for the son to have, uh, to have uh, what's the word, expression in the earth. The son speaks to his eternality, the child to his entrance into time as the man, Christ Jesus. He was not Jesus in eternity past, he was the son. He became Jesus at Bethlehem, and Jesus is the, is the name of his humiliation. That's why, by the way, right now he has a new name, doesn't he? Hmm? Does he? Hmm. Revelation 19 says so. He's got a new name that no man knows. And that's the name referred to in Philippians chapter 2. Don't make that name Jesus. He has given him the name which is above every name. That at the name which Jesus now possesses, it's the name of his exaltation. It is not Jesus and it is not known Jesus is the name of his humiliation. And when you find that name, Jesus, in the New Testament Scripture by itself, exclusive from the name Lord or Christ, prefixing, prefixing it or suffixing it, then it speaks to his humiliation. So again, Hebrews 2. But we see, we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. You see, that's his humiliation. But the name which he now possesses is the name of his exaltation and his glory. And it is at that name, that new name, that every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 19. Discourse on the second coming. So Jesus now... Uh, has visited Jacob as the son, and he has subdued him, and he has changed his name. And read verse 30 then, and following, And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for he said, I have seen God face to face, and my life is spared. Now, there's any doubt in his mind who he met? I have seen Elohim face to face, and my life is preserved. And as he passed over Penuel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted or limped on his thigh. There's a very beautiful picture there, by the way, if you'll observe it. The sun rising speaks to resurrection, the entrance of light. And the entrance of light came on the scene, resurrection came on the scene only after Jacob halted on his thigh. And it's only after you become a weak vessel in the hand of the Lord 
that resurrection life and power and light are going to be your portion. And that'll preach. Therefore the children of Israel eat not of the sinew which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh unto this day, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew that shrank. So he shortened the ligament. So they, uh, Jacob had to halt on his thigh. Now, Jacob is another man, isn't he? Rather like Saul was changed into another man, he's going to meet Esau face to face. Remarkable. Hmm? And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked. Behold, Esau came with him 400 men, and he divided the children unto Leah and unto Rachel and unto the two handmaids. And he put the handmaids and their children foremost, and Leah and her children after, and Rachel and Joseph last of all. And he passed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. Quite a change, would you say? Well, that's not the only change that took place. Looks like a change took place in Esau also, would you say? Verse 4, And Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Remarkable. Hmm. <coughs> Well, let's move on for time's sake. Yes, yes, he is. That's right. He is. But his fear of him has gone out, isn't it? Well, let's pick up from verse 17. And Jacob journeyed to Succoth after this meeting with Esau. Esau returned on his way to Mount Seir. By the way, verse 16. Mount Seir, you remember, is the Mount of Edom, wherein is the capital city of Petra in Mount Seir. And remember, those names are all associated with Esau. Edom, Petra, and Seir. Petra is that great city abandoned, of course, today in the which Dr. J.E. Blackstone uh, a lawyer, about the turn of the century, a wealthy lawyer, purchased one million New Testaments in Hebrew and hid them there. And they're there today in Mount Petra because he was firmly convinced that's where God was going to hide Israel away for 1260 days in the time of Jacob's trouble. Personally, I'm convinced he was right and the provision is made for them <clears throat> by him to read the New Testament. Somebody might say, well, does that have any biblical precedent? <clears throat> well, I don't know if it does or not, but uh, whether it has biblical precedent or not, I think it's nice to have the word available to them uh, so that when they're hid away, they can uh, uh, have a, what's the word, a ready reference to the New Testament revelation. And Jacob journeyed to Succoth and built him a house and made booths for his cattle, and therefore he called the name of the place Succoth, which means booths. And Jacob came to Sal uh, Shalom, a city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Paden Aram and pitched his tent before the city, and he bought a portion of field where he, where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money, erected an altar there, and called it El El Oi Israel, which is a tricky phrase which means God the God of Israel. Now in chapter 34, we'll not labor with it, we have the defilement of Dinah by the sons of Shechem in the land. And then they tried to purchase her, you remember, for the wife of Shechem. Uh, and uh, the uh, two sons, or all of the sons of Jacob were most upset with this, but Simeon and Levi decided they were going to avenge Dinah. And so they made a league with the sons of Homer, or Hamor, and they uh, uh, told him that they would give their daughter to him to wife if all of their men were circumcised. And so they were circumcised, and after they were circumcised, when they were yet sore, then Simeon and Levi and their bands came in and attacked them and destroyed them. Well, this was an act of treachery since they had made covenant with this people. And they agreed to be circumcised. And that act brought them into covenant relationship with the people of God. 
And in the midst of that covenant, they defiled the covenant and acted in treachery. And for that reason, God dropped Simeon and Levi from the order of uh, the firstborn. And you remember we indicated it to you in a previous class that there is a digression now from Reuben, who is the firstborn. It would drop to Simeon, and then it would drop to Levi, and uh, whoops. And all of these were removed because Reuben defiled his couch because of the treachery of Simeon and Levi, and it falls finally to who? To the fourthborn. Judah. Okay, so the birthright is reckoned through Joseph, but the genealogy is reckoned through Judah. And Judah takes the right of the firstborn then. In chapter 35, then, verse 9 and following, and God appears to Jacob again. When he came out of Paden Aram, and he blessed him. And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall, thy name, uh, shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. <clears throat> he gave to him, then, in other words, a twofold testimony one through the Son and now through the Father, testifies to the covenant relationship which God has with this man Jacob. And verse 11, And God said unto him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply, a nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins, and the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed after thee will I give the land. So here is the renewal of the Abrahamic covenant with Jacob, but I want you to notice something that specifically the emphasis here is upon the land, isn't it? He said, nations and kings are going to come out of you, and in effect, indeed, out of Jacob is going to come Messiah, but the emphasis is upon the land. You remember that we are not called the children of Jacob by faith. We are called the children of Abraham by faith. Abraham had see as a seed as multitudinous as the sand which is on the seashore, which looked to the line of Jacob and his earthly inheritance, and the stars which are in the heavens, uh, his spiritual or heavenly inheritance, our heavenly citizenship, in other words. Now we have a notable scene, in verse 16 and following. It's the death of, of uh, Rachel and the birth, at this point, of Jacob's last son, Benjamin. And they journeyed from Bethel, and there, was but a, there were but a little way to come to Ephrath. And Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. Now, Ephrath was the area around Bethlehem. I would refer you to Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Thou Bethlehem Ephrathah. Though thou be small among the children of Judah, then out of, yet out of thee shall come forth he whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Micah 5, 2 prophesies the birth of the Lord Jesus in Bethlehem, and that is the passage which was quoted to Herod when Herod inquired of the scribes as to where Messiah was to be born at the appearance of the uh, uh, magi, the sorcerers from uh, uh, the Far East, from Iran and Persia, uh, what was Persia then. By the way, you understand that the word translated magi is the same word translated sorcerer with regard to Simon in the book of Acts. That kind of shatters a lot of idealistic views, but it's true nonetheless. They were sorcerers. They were astrologers. But these astrologers had been very deeply influenced by the captivity of the children of Israel, particularly in the days of Daniel. And they became what is now known in religious circles as Zoroastrians. They were followers of Zoroastra. And Zoroastra, who started Zoroastrianism, established a religion that was so close to Judaism that it's very difficult to tell it from it. And probably is the only other than Islam, the only really monotheistic religion in the world that looks for, anticipates the coming of a messiah. 
But they were reading those anticipations in the heavenlies, which we indicated to you at the outset of this class could be found in Genesis 1.14, those signs in the heavens. And they, announced, they got the announcement that Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem, Ephrathah. All right, we're coming to Ephrathah here. Uh, verse 18, And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, for she died, Bethlehem is associated with death and life in the scripture. Death and life. Came to pass as her soul was departing before she died that she called his name Benoni. Now Benoni means what? Son of sorrow. Benoni means son of sorrow. So as she died, she called him son of sorrow. What is the Lord Jesus called? Isaiah 53. Man of what? Sorrows. Man of sorrows. I want you to see in Benjamin a figure of the Lord Jesus at this place called Bethlehem, which means, by the way, what? House of bread. Yeah. House of bread, Bethlehem. So Bethel, house of God, and so forth. The word Beth, house. Uh, she called him Benoni, son of sorrows, looking to the death, the humiliation, the sorrows of Christ. But his father called him Benjamin, which is what? Son of my right hand, which speaks to the exaltation of Christ, doesn't it? In resurrection. So we have death and life at this point. And Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. You got Micah 5 too, right? Okay. And Jacob set a pillar upon her grave, and that is the pillar of Rachel's grave unto this day, which grave, by the way, can be observed in the land of Israel. Now, in uh, verse 23 and following, you have the enumeration of the 12 sons of Jacob. <clears throat> 12 great princes in Israel. Remember, we pointed out to you also that Ishmael had 12 sons, didn't we? 12 princes born of him. So, though the inheritance did not pass through Ishmael, yet God blessed Ishmael in the same way that he blessed Jacob with regard to his posterity. All right. Um, And Jacob, verse 27, came unto Isaac his father, unto Mamre, unto the city of Arba, which is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac sojourned. And the days of Isaac were 104 score years, and Isaac died and was gathered unto his people, being old and full of days. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him there. In chapter 36, you have the dukes of Edom, or the chiefs, if you would, of Edom, and uh, the posper posterity of, of uh, Esau can be traced through those lines through his various wives. You can, uh, you can observe uh, uh, the lines that came out of Esau that gave problems to the children of Jacob. Now, I want you to come to chapter 37. This is what we've been pressing toward. The great saga of the man Joseph. Now, I would have you observe that in this man Joseph, to whom obtained the birth, uh, pertained the birthright, you'll remember, because he was the firstborn of the beloved wife. Joseph is going to become a remarkable portrayal of the man Christ Jesus for a number of reasons. God elaborates on the life of Joseph. Joseph was very dear to the Lord as well, as he was dear to his father Jacob. Verse 1 of 37. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a sojourner in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Billah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now, what was the testimony which Jesus had to give concerning Israel? It was an evil report. Is that true? He came unto his own and his own what? We'll see that in a moment. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. He was the beloved son because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. Now two things are testified to in the coat of many colors. The first one is it is the sign of the covenant. When he gave that coat 
to uh, Joseph, he was saying by that that I am passing covenant blessing on to Joseph. Remember that covenant was made in the scripture by an exchange of garments. The one making a covenant with the other would give him his coat, and they would trade coats in effect. You'll recall that when um, Jonathan made covenant with David that he gave him his coat. So he is testifying by this that Joseph is the beloved son and the covenant blessing is passing to him, which we've already indicated to you in 1 Chronicles 5 was the case, you'll remember, that the blessing, the birthright, belonged to Joseph. But the genealogy was reckoned through Jacob. So that when he gave him this coat of many colors, he was before the rest of his son saying, this is my chosen son. This is the one that's going to get the birthright. The second, beyond that, it testifies to the glory of Christ, the coat of many colors. Now, I, I just want to take time to point this out to you. Color in the scripture is tremendously significant, like numbers are tremendously significant. And uh, if, what does the scripture say with regard to God? What is the nature of God? God is what? Two things are pronounced. Hmm? Light, all right. God is love and God is light. How can I do this? I'll shorten it. Do it that way. Okay. There we are. That's called a prism, okay? In case anybody can't tell my art, I'm not an artist, nor the son of an artist. Now, if you pass light through a prism, what do you get? All the colors of the spectrum, or a rainbow if you would. Now, there are three basic colors. Now, this is a coat of many colors, you understand. Um, there are three basic colors to the colors of the spectrum. Blue, green, and red. Now, all of the other color, colors are shades out of these. Blue, green, and red. And the high side of these, the blue, are colors that can't be seen. For example, x-rays, gamma rays, and all that sort of thing, which comes out of the heavens, which affect our lives, but which cannot be seen. Anybody picking up the analogy? God is light. What did God say to Job, for example? Knowest thou the way whereby light is parted? Job knew you could part light. God told Job that. You can part light. All right, that's how you part light. And if God is light and light is parted, is God parted? Indeed. Blue is the color of heaven in the scripture. That's why in the tabernacle, for example, the curtains are blue, scarlet, purple, fine twine linen. The blue speaks to heaven, the fine twine linen white speaks to righteousness, the scarlet to the blood, and the purple to his royalty, to his authority, his rulership. And blue speaks to the Father. Green is the color of life, growth, and it speaks to the sun. And by the way, there's a green rainbow over God's head on the throne, isn't there? Hmm? So that's what John saw, a vision uh, of the throne, and over the head of him that sat on the throne, uh, a rainbow like unto an emerald. That's green, I think. So this speaks to the sun. And red is the color of energy. And that obviously speaks to the spirit in power. So here's the parting of light. And God gave to Joseph then a coat of many colors, and this becomes, therefore, the manifold revelation of God. When you talk about the glory of God then, this is what you're talking about. The glory of God is the manifold revelation of God. God is light, and I begin to understand the glory of God when I begin to see how that light is parted. Uh, let me give you the address. I just threw that out. See, I think Job's in the Old Testament, isn't it? There it is. When was the last time he looked, anyhow, huh? 3824. 3824. Oh, what is that? Do you, do you, if you know, it's fine. What is that in Isaiah where it talks about? Did it talk about this in Isaiah? The parting of light? Oh, no, the coat of many colors. I 
I don't know, brother. I'll try to remember. It'll be. All right, so we've got the glory of the Son. The Father gave him that glory. Jesus, for example, came to us according to John chapter 1. We beheld his glory as of the what? Only begotten of the Father. Where did he get his glory? The only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. But when he came into this world and became obedient into, even to the death of the cross, he gave up that glory, didn't he? That's why he said then in John 17 in his prayer, Restore unto me the glory which I had with you before the world was. So he is about to surrender this glory. And seen in a figure in Joseph, Joseph is about to surrender that coat of many colors. All right, verse 5. I'm sorry, verse 4. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Now, I hope you're getting a view of Jesus and the attitude of his brethren toward him. Precisely the same. And why did they hate Jesus? Because he knew the Father. That's why they wanted to stone him, because he said uh, God was his Father. John 10, verse 5. And Joseph dreamed a dream and told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. He's got a heavenly revelation, and they're hating him for the heavenly revelation. Continually, you see, it multiplies the figure of the Lord Jesus and his position with his brethren. And here's the dream, verse 7. Uh, we were binding sheaves in the field. Lo, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. In other words, they bowed down to it. You're going to bow down to me. Um, which they did in Genesis 42. In uh, verse 9, it had more of a prophetic view, but we come to the that's the immediate view in verse 7. We come to the prophetic view in his second dream in verse 9. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it to his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream which thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth now? Would you like to tell me, please, uh, what Jacob, his father, interpreted the sun and the moon and the eleven stars to mean? Him and his wife and his, the rest of the brothers. Okay? Very fine. Would somebody like to read Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1 for me, please? There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Isn't that remarkable? And so somebody comes along and makes that the church. How silly. Hmm. Scripture interprets Scripture. And the Scripture interprets the sun and the moon and the eleven stars to be Israel, the twelve sons of Jacob. The woman in the scripture is prophetically Israel when found in the place of righteousness. When found in the place of wickedness, it's the mystery of iniquity. But in Genesis 3.15, who gives birth to the seed? The woman, correct? That woman of Revelation 12 is Israel, not the church. And it's defined to be Israel by this dream which Joseph had. And it looks to the prophetic end of the nation of Israel, which is what Revelation 12 has in mind, the prophetic end of the children of Israel. So the sheaves speak to the immediate present, and the 12 sons of Jacob were going to bow to her, the 11 sons of Jacob were going to bow to him. The stars and the sun and moon speak to the prophetic end of the children of Israel, when again, the son of promise will be bowed to by the rest of Israel. Is that going to be the case? Indeed it will. And we'll see a beautiful picture of that in due course. No, it hadn't happened yet. It's going to happen. No, it hadn't happened. Yes, in chapter 42, right. when now they come. What you're referring to here is Jesus, not Joseph. That is correct. He's just a picture of it. Right. right, that is correct. The prophetic view of verse 9 is when Israel, the nation, bows to Christ at his second coming. 
When they look on him whom they have pierced, and they mourn because of him, and Israel, the nation, shall be born in a day. And he's going to put away their iniquity, Zechariah said, in one day. That's when they vowed to him. But did they vow to Joseph? They did. Yes, they did. Mother and father. Yes, they came before him. Well, see, he was he was regent, vice regent in Egypt. That was required, right? Well, I've never been there. Mm -hmm. What a beautiful picture then, isn't it? Uh, there's a lot of play on this through the scripture. I might, I might just throw this out to you. Jesus put it on the Pharisees. He said, if, uh, if Messiah, Christ, is David's son, then why does David call him Lord? See, you can see that play on that circumstance. Here is the father bound to the son. That's unheard of in an oriental economy. And so Jesus put that on the Pharisees. If, if indeed Messiah is David's son, and why did David call him Lord? Because he is the root and the offspring of David. You get that? The root, David grows out of that root. He is the offspring of David. He's the fruit that came out of David. So he's on both ends of David. He's the reason for David being there, and David becomes the channel through which he comes, which is interesting. And only God could do that, couldn't he? Verse 14. Uh, he said, Go, I pray thee. And his brethren are gone from him now. They're out feeding the flock. And they went to Shechem. He said, Go, I pray thee, and see whether it be well with thy brethren and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. Now he is sent by his father to his brethren, right? So who sent Jesus, the father? To whom? To Israel. All right. And Shechem, by the way, means fellowship. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, which I think is an important phrase, they conspired against him to slay him. John 1, 11, He came unto his own, but his own received him not. But isn't it interesting that even there is a remnant, but to as many as received him, them gave he the authority to become the born ones of God. Was there a remnant even in that day that received Jesus? Is there a remnant among his brethren that would receive what he says? Judah, you remember, wanted to deliver him. But he got kind of uh, cheated out of the opportunity, but his heart was manifest in any case. Uh, Reuben, you're right, I'm sorry. Beg your pardon. Verse 22, that's where I'm going to read now. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. So there's a remnant that uh, wants to believe. Now, what's the idea of their casting him into the pit? Which thing they did? Here is the place of death and burial. Right. So he's going to go into burial. Notice what happened verse 23. They stripped him of his coat of many colors. Humiliation. Surrendered his glory. In other words. And they cast him into the pit, and it was empty, and there was no water in it. We've got an old brother in our assembly, by the way, that gets a big kick out of that passage. Because somebody's always put, putting improper, not undue, but improper emphasis on water baptism. And water baptism is forever getting stuck into Romans chapter 6. And so he, he loves this passage. They put him in a pit wherein there's no water. Romans 6 speaks to death and resurrection indeed. And there's no water in it. Pardon? Oh. <laughs> now verse 26. Here's where Judah figures into the scene. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites... And let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh, and his brethren were content. Now what does this suggest to you? They delivered him not up to be stoned themselves under Jewish law. Pilate said, you go judge him after your law. But what did they say? Well, all right, it's not lawful for us to put a man to death. What they were saying was it isn't lawful for us to crucify a man. And they wanted him crucified. And Jesus said that you're going to deliver the Son of Man up into the hands of the Gentiles, sinful men, and he'll be crucified. So what did they do here? They delivered him into the hands of the Gentiles, didn't they? All right. With that view in mind, by the way, um, uh, I think that... Uh, uh, what's, I'm, I'm trying to get back the verse now. I'm sorry. I got away from my verse. Oh, so the Son of Man should be delivered into the hands of Gentiles and be crucified. 
and be raised up on the third day then. So he has to be surrendered into the hands of Gentiles. So they take him out of the pit now and deliver him to the Gentiles. So the figure is complete with regard to death and resurrection. And they brought Joseph into Egypt, verse 28. Now, uh, what is Egypt a figure of in the Scripture? The world. And after Jesus is rejected by his brethren, to whom does the call of God go? To the world, to the Gentile world. So Romans chapter 11, verse 11. The putting away of Israel begins to be salvation for the Gentiles. And Joseph is going to go down into Egypt and he's going to end up delivering Egypt, isn't he? From great famine and so forth. You all want to take a break? Perhaps we better do that for just about five minutes and we'll come back and get on with it. <laughs> all right, now, Joseph is banished. Now, uh, now they came back and told Jacob, of course, that his son was dead. So in a figure, Joseph has died. To his family, he's died, hasn't he? And they to him, which is what happened to Israel. In effect, they died. His blood be on us and on our children. And his blood was and is. And Jacob ran his clothes, verse 34, put on sackcloth and mourned for his son many days. He mourned for his uh, beloved son. And verse 36, the Midianites then sold him into the hands of Potiphar. Now these are Ishmaelites out of the land of Midian. They're Ishmaelites or Arabs out of the land of Midian. And they're selling him into Pharaoh's Potiphar's uh, officer, the captain of the guard, into his hands as a slave. Now you'll notice that all of a sudden the narrative about Joseph stops. And chapter 38 is a strange intrusion of Judah's sin. Why is this there? Now, I emphasized to you once before, you'll remember, that God does not put things in the Scripture necessarily in the order of their historical happening, but rather He puts them in the Scripture because of the spiritual illustration that He's intending me to have. I've given you a New Testament first in connection with that. What is it? I've quoted that dozens of times in your hearing. New Testament verse which testifies that the order of things in the Old Testament are not just because God wants to give me a historical. 1 Corinthians. All right. These things are written for our admonition and learning. That's why he put them in the order in which he did. This incident in Jews, Judah's life is totally out of context with what God is dealing with. He's talking about the life of Joseph. And when he started out in chapter 37 of the life of Joseph, he's going to go all the way to the end of the book now, all the way to the end of Genesis with this great saga of the life of Joseph. Why then does he stick Judah's shame in here? Ah, so. After Christ is put away, Israel goes into spiritual harlotry. And that's what happened here. Judah, you remember, is the line through whom the birthright is reckoned. He stands for the whole people of Israel. The authority, the place of authority. And where is authority submitted? Into harlotry, spiritual adultery. Now, without reading the whole chapter, you remember Tamar, his firstborn's wife. Now, God hated uh, J Judah's firstborn, so he killed him. That's hard on humanistic thinking. You know that? God didn't like him and he killed him. So uh, that left Tamar a widow. Well, what did that require according to Oriental custom? All right. He should have given his brother to Tamar uh, as a husband. Now, before that was law, it was custom and God had honored it to raise up seed to his brother. But Judah didn't do that. And Judah didn't do that. And Judah didn't do that. And so Tamar figured up this little idea, pretty good one. She must have known something about the moral character of her father-in-law too, by the way. And so she goes out and disguises herself as a harlot, sits by the wayside, Judah comes through, sees her, goes in unto her, and she bears seed, twins to be exact, by her father-in-law. So it speaks to spiritual adultery. You see that? Or harlotry. Uh... She gets a pledge from him in verse 18, so she's able to come to him later on and prove what, she, what uh, he's done. Um, 
And the pledge then in verse 18, the signet, the bracelets, the staff in thy hand, and he gave them to her and came in unto her and she conceived by him. But he still didn't know that it's his daughter-in-law. Remember that they were veiled women and she stayed that way, which is kind of an enigma, but nonetheless, that's so. Verse 24, And it came to pass about three months after that it was told Judah, saying, Tamar thy daughter-in-law hath played the harlot. And also, behold, she is with child by holotry. And Judah said, Bring her forth and let her be burned. Self-righteous individual. Hmm? And verse 25, And when she was brought forth, she said to her father-in-law, saying, By the man whose these are am I with child. And she said, Discern, I pray thee, whose are these, the signet and the bracelets and the staff? And Judah acknowledged them and said, She hath been more righteous than I, which was noble, because that I gave her not to shield up my son, and he knew her again no more. And it came to pass in the time of her travail that, behold, twins were in her womb. And it came to pass when she travailed that the one put forth his hand, and the midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread, saying, This came out first. Now he became the firstborn. And it came to pass as he drew back his hand that, behold, his brother came out, and she said, How hast thou broken forth? This breach be upon thee. Therefore his name was called Perez. And afterward came out his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his hand, and his name was called Zerah. So Perez was the secondborn, Zerah the firstborn, because he came out first. And again, God does what? He rejects the first and chooses the second. When you come to that very short genealogy at the end of the book of Ruth, you will observe that Perez, the secondborn, shows up in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus, in David in that case, and finally Jesus. Perez is further enumerated in the genealogy of Matthew chapter 1, is he not? Now, another thing I want you to see here, that each time there is an illustration of the son being banished into a foreign land, and in a figure of Israel there, there are always two sons born. Have you observed, for example, in your reading that when Moses was banished from his brethren and he was in the land of the, of, in the wilderness, that he begat two sons? Took a Gentile wife and begat two sons? Uh, you have observed when uh, uh, Joseph, we will if you haven't, uh, takes a wife, Asenath, a Gentile wife, that he begets two sons? Now here in a figure Israel put away and two sons are begotten. What is the suggestion? And all of them are relative to the putting away of Israel and the calling out of the Gentiles, the people for his name. What is the emphasis? Mm -mm. No. Well, that's the principle. It was, it was the case in all of those as well. That's right. Like Ephraim and Manasseh, he rejected Manasseh and chose Ephraim. He rejects uh, Zerah and chooses Paris. He rejects the first and chooses the second. That's right, and that's relative to this. But before we get to that, what do we got? He's made of the twain. One, right, new man. All right, what do they come out of? Jew and Gentile. So there's three major groups of people in the world. Jew, Gentile, and Church of God, right? Jew-Gentile have a remnant taken out of them that make the church. Okay? And they are one flesh. And how did he get it? He rejected the first, the Jew, and chose the second, the Gentile. So we have in a figure then, when Israel is put away, God rejects Israel and chooses a Gentile, but he gets a remnant out of each one of them, and he makes of that one, of those twain, one new man. All right, now we leave that narrative, that just short intrusion there, and we come back then to the narrative of Joseph. And we're going to get a repetition of the humiliation of Christ. In the first case, we had a figure of his reje rejection by his brethren and his death, burial, and resurrection, and his banished uh, into a foreign land or banished from his brethren. Now in chapter 39 we're going to get a view of his humiliation. God is going to go back and add details to what he's already said. We gave you, remember, the law of uh, reoccurrence 
at the outside of the study. So God's going to go back and add details to what was formerly in a figure, the experience of Christ. And in this case, he's going to be falsely accused. He's going to be identified with spiritual or with uh, adultery, falsely accused of adultery, as the world tries to identify Christ with their spiritual harlotry, like the world church, for example. And he's put into prison. And that prison is a figure of what? The burial of Christ. Uh, I don't think we're going to get into this because we don't have time to pursue it. So just spend a little time with chapter 39 and 40, and uh, we'll come back to that in our next class. Uh, while you're doing it, meditate on what the idea of the being, his being put in prison relative to Christ, his being put in prison, how that's, what that suggests regarding the New Testament revelation. All right? Any questions, comments? Yes, ma'am. In uh, uh, verse 34, uh, 36, where it says, Jacob tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his loins. Yes. Is it possible that that's uh, a picture of, of uh, the rending of a veil and, and the darkness that covers the earth? I just wondered if that's one of these guys across. Hmm. <laughs> Well, right offhand, I would not see that to be the case, Donna, but uh, I wouldn't say it wasn't. I wouldn't see that to be the case. It certainly speaks to humiliation, the humiliation of his people. That's the whole idea of his rending his clothes and, and uh, pouring sackcloth, or putting on sackcloth. Well, yeah, that's why he did it, but in the figure, it's the humiliation of the people of God. In the same, for the same reason Job did it. Job put on sackcloth and satin ashes, you remember. It spoke to his humiliation. I just wonder if this Jacob here was his wife and father and so much. Shalom.